De imediato, então, nós passamos a palavra para a sua palestra, com o tema Criatividade Construindo o Futuro, a Ger Leonard. Thank you. Bom dia. Good morning. That's, that's all my Portuguese, unfortunately. Or Brazilian, rather. It's great to be here. Uh, this is my 10th time or so in Brazil. I'm almost very happy to come back. I live in Switzerland, where we have snow right now, so it's quite good to be here. Uh, many of you are obviously on Twitter, so I have a hashtag called Asgurt. Can we get the slides up, please, on my, on my screen here? Not that I can't speak without slides, but I could. So if you are, if you are on Twitter, it's Asgurt is the hashtag, okay? Uh, and I will talk to you about the future uh, that I call from ego to eco. Many of you may wonder what a futurist is. Is, I, is there a word in Portuguese, futurologo, or something like this, I suppose, or la prospective, they say in French. Um, what I do is basically this. My work consists of four sides. So I'm not predicting, I'm not Nostradamus, I'm not Paul Saffo, unfortunately, or Alvin Toffler or Ray Kurzweil. Most of my work is in the next three to five years about the, what I call the immediate future. Um, there's a great saying in China that says, if you want to know about the future, ask your children. And it's very true because most of my work is, I do the obvious. Um, and of course, what people have said about futurists is, uh, if you know, um, various uh, science, science fiction authors have written about uh, pattern recognition. You know, recognizing a pattern that is going to repeat to then say what could happen in five years or so. I work with over 100 clients with my company called The Futures Agency, and we try to help them come up with new business models. So, uh, let's start at the beginning. You know this, of course, very true in Brazil. You know, Brazil is number one worldwide on Twitter, and I think it's number two on Facebook. Uh, and of course, uh, every single person is now trying to get a smartphone and a tablet is exploding in this country. We are truly becoming what I call a network society a society that is interconnected and always on, so you, you can always look up things, you can use apps to find out what other people are doing. It's a pretty amazing change that has only really become possible because of the mobile internet. And here in Brazil, of course, mobile internet is quite expensive, and that hopefully that will change. But becoming a network society means, as John Elkerton says in his book called The Zero Nods, He says, in a world of nine billion people, we'll demand fundamental changes in our mindsets, behaviors, cultures, and paradigms. In other, ways, in other words, if we keep on living like we do now, when we reach nine billion people, we'll be pretty much as close as dead. And that has a lot of reasons. Consumption, energy use, attitude towards culture and nature, and so on, right? That basically is not survivable, and if, if you read his book, you'll find out exactly why, but really what's happening is that uh, this is, uh, world that we have now is becoming what Marshall McLuhan called 1971. Do you know Marshall McLuhan is one of the biggest, uh, earliest media futurists? Uh, he's calling it a global village. And this is really what we have now, so let's listen to him for a second. The uh, global village is a world in which you don't necessarily have harmony, you have extreme concern with everybody else's business, and much involvement in everybody else's life. It's a sort of Ann Landers column writ large. And uh, it uh, doesn't necessarily mean harmony, and peace and quiet, but it does mean huge involvement. So he's talking about 1971, he's talking about Facebook, right? It does not mean harmony, peace, and quiet. It means considerable chaos. So a world that is doing this, a global village, obviously will entail a lot of chaos. Otherwise, it, would, it wouldn't be a village. It would be an empire. Right? Because then you don't have to talk to anyone. Basically, as the CEO of Nike says, chaos is not a hurdle. It's an opportunity. And I think going forward, we have to embrace the fact that we have many opinions, many fragmented beliefs, Many assumptions all on top of each other. So chaos is part of what we're seeing in the future. But we can be sure of one thing. This is a tough me uh, message from our clients. Business as usual is dead. Think about this for a second. 
If you're a car company, it's very unlikely you're going to sell cars like you sell cars today 10 years from now for dozens of reasons. But it's going to be about transportation, not about cars. So BMW, Audi, Mercedes in Germany are putting a lot of resources into self-driving cars, into electric vehicles, into virtual transportation. So you may very well be traveling with a BMW virtual travel machine in 10 years. Right? It has nothing to do with the car. Business as usual is dead, and, and one of my key theories is that we're moving from a world that was in a walled garden, you know, big companies, big countries, big government, big banks, big media, into a world that is distributed. So what we're seeing on the internet is, for example, all of you are YouTube users, right? On YouTube, nobody makes the program. We make the program on YouTube. There's no person in New York telling us what to watch. So it's completely distributed. We're moving into a world of ecosystems. And uh, I hope I pronounce this right, the J. Dinjo, or J. Jinjo, I think. Is that, is that it? I, but I think the shift in this world requires a shift, require a lot of improvisation, uh, which I'm, I'm sure you're very good at in this country. But many people have said that we're entering the era of the Anthropocene. You know, they're basically the, the era of where human beings have the most impact on everything. Everything that we have touched, everything that we're doing is changing the entire environment for technology, for, for energy, for how we interact. And as Al Gore has said, global warming constitutes the biggest market failure in capitalism. I mean, why is it, simple question, why is it that we all know that if it goes on like this with global warming, yeah, it will just kill us? But there is a business in it, but we haven't figured out what the business is. So really, the market, market has failed us uh, in regards to delivering a solution to this. And, and now in America, of course, you know, you fall in the debate, you know, if you even mention the word climate change, you probably won't get elected. I mean, can you think about it? The most important issue in the world cannot be mentioned for the election. That's kind of pathetic. I, I hope you don't follow that route in, a, in Brazil. But basically what we're seeing is that, you know, in this complex world, there is no more growth at any cost. We're moving in this world that is looking a lot more like this, away from the oil and carbon dependency. But in regards to innovation, right, we have this huge problem on a worldwide level that everybody's looking toward growth and profit. So we're barking up the street saying, you know, we want to make more money, go forward, invent new things, have new technologies, which is good, right? But really where the treasure is in the future is the gross benefit. And how does it benefit everyone in the system? And this is not anti-capitalist, right? It's the opposite. Because in the gross benefit, there's a huge amount of new business and innovation to be found. We just have to stop barking up the wrong part of the tree. And in a way, we need sort of a new social contract. I mean, it's interesting to see that the social contract in America has pretty much expired. Right? And that contract was, we're all living to be the American dream, the next big thing. Right? Now it's no longer possible. In Europe, we have a more egalitarian view, and that still remains to be seen if we can survive. But in Brazil, you know, that new social contract is in progress. And I have a couple examples to show you on this. So, my key theme today is the idea of saying that we're moving from the society that's based on a pyramid, you know, a top-down system, to a society that's more like a biosphere. And I don't, I don't mean this in a green sense, you know, not only. I mean it in a sense of how we interact, right? The biosphere that is rather than a myosphere, right, which is about what I do and what I get, so if you're looking at all of the success in the last 10 years, all of the commercial success were companies that build biospheres. Amazon, Google. You could argue Google is a myosphere. Yeah, you could argue that, but probably not entirely true. Right? Twitter, YouTube, Skype, eBay, right? Orkut in Brazil. Right? These are biospheres. Right? They're not centralized companies. And so when I talk about this, I get a lot of people saying, yes, you know, but we, if we focus on climate change or environment, then there's no business. 
don't believe it. It's not true. And we don't have to choose between economic growth and protecting the environment. We don't. So this is a myth that we see around the world as a real problem. And the CEO of Unilever said something very important just a couple of weeks ago. Uh, said, in order to live within the natural limits of the planet, we will have to decouple growth from environmental impact. In other words, we can't grow based on taking everything that we can get for free from the environment. That will just not work. There's no business in this. And talking about the stock market, which is closed today, at least in New York, for obvious reasons, huh? even the UN Secretary General says the old model of economic development is a global suicide pact. In other words, because the way that we're looking at growth and profit is essentially a collaboration to die. So that leads to change and David Corton, who runs Yes! Magazine, he's, he's actually talking about a suicide economy. Right? It's an economy that says growth and profit at all costs. And that's what we had so far. So what I would appeal to you here in Brazil not to follow that path of the suicide economy. Because clearly, in Europe or America or other places, we're already pretty much in this path. I think this is a huge opportunity for innovation, but we have to question a few toxic assumptions, you know, a few things that are poisoning our thinking. And one is this, the two-dimensional life of profit and growth, which of course, uh, to a large extent, has been driven also by the digital economy. And the other thing is that, you know, we need to really look at how we can have offensive innovation but not defensive innovation. How we can be quicker. I mean, here in Brazil, you have lots and lots of startups now who are doing exactly this. Offensive innovation is really sort of ultimately a reinvention, a questioning and a going forward of what we're seeing. So disruption is a key factor. Of course, you know, I lived in America for 15 years where the mantra of American innovation is disruption, of course. But you just have to look at other entrepreneurs like um, uh, Richard Branson, right, who's basically always disrupting something that isn't really working. And I would submit to you, if you're, in, if you're interested in innovation, if you're not actually disrupting something, probably means it doesn't matter. Because you're actually not fixing a real big issue. I mean, what did Google disrupt? Finding information. What did YouTube disrupt? getting videos or video material from other people that they want to share. I mean, this process was broken in regular television, of course. So, um, the boss of Unilever again, he says, business can, again, he says, business can know that does not function. So, in other words, if we have a dysfunctional system because we're heading towards what is called a suicide economy, then how can we make a business out of this? I mean, clearly that's something we have to say. Climate change is costing serious trillions of dollars. So this is also much, very much a, a business problem. I would submit to you that most future innovation will be based on creating and nurturing sustainable ecosystems. In fact, I would tell you that there is no other way to be successful than to build an ecosystem. You can have an ecosystem like Apple. Right? Apple is extremely successful and extremely centralized right, and controls what we do with whatever they're trying to do. Right? And they have a good window for this. So there are examples. But if you're going to be like Apple, you're going to, that's, that's as good as saying you're going to be a flying pig. Right? Basically, it's not going to work for most of us. Because the other thing that's happening is that in order to build a good ecosystem, we need all the pieces in place. For example, the reason that we don't have electric cars in Brazil or pretty much anywhere else, being the number one mode of transportation, is because they only go 100 kilometers or 200, and then, and then you can't refill. There's no place to charge the car. So there's no ecosystem. If we had an ecosystem with electric vehicles and car sharing with electric vehicles and self-driving cars, we wouldn't be needing cars, regular cars that we have now. In fact, we probably wouldn't have to own a car because we can just share a car or call one on the mobile phone. But we need to build that ecosystem. This is very important. We can't just take it out and say, well, we have this car, but then there's no support for it. So Jeremy Rifkin wrote a great book called The Third Industrial Revolution. 
I think it's actually available in uh, Portuguese as well. It's a great book. And he's saying that the energy revolution is following the communication revolution. What he's saying is that we have the internet now, and mobile internet, of course, which is the biggest driver of this. But very soon, we're going to have what he calls the intergrid. Right? It's technology that allows people to put energy back into the system and take it out when they need it. Number one problem, of course, for that is the storage that, that we have to work on. Right? But that is basically what he's saying, and I agree, I agree with him, that we're moving towards a society that's on an intergrid of technology for energy, for education, and for media. So green technology and green business, in my view, will become the number one economic driver, especially in so-called developing countries, or whatever you want to call them. The bricks. I mean, look at the uh, evolution of green, of green plastic bottles that could be 100% recyclable. It's not going to happen in Germany first. It's going to happen here first. If you look at all the other stuff, like uh, uh, smart meters, water machines that make water out of any sewage water, was invented in San Francisco, called the, uh, this is called the uh, flip, flip uh, machine or something. Uh, and of course, smart metering that we have in Europe, smart grid houses, and as Carl Sagan says, if we are to survive, our loyalties must be broadened further to include the whole human community. Not just to include our own company or our own country. This is a major, major challenge, I think, in our thinking. So here's a question I have for you. Maybe we can answer later in the discussion, right? Can we grow more but with less environmental impact because of technology? Or is that just a dream? I would answer that and say, yes, in many cases, I think we can have technology helping us to grow more with less impact by being more efficient. But there's also quite a few things that we just have to change in the way that we're doing things. Technology can be an answer, and the green tech, of course, is exploding. But then there's many other things that we have to look at. I think being sustainable is no longer a trendy word. It's like a fig leaf, you know, where big companies hide behind for greenwashing what they're doing. Sustainable is becoming a default consumer expectation. In five years, you will not find a single hotel in many countries that are not environmentally oriented and give back to the environment because consumers will not go there because they're not giving back. This is a chief driver of innovation. If you see 66% of consumers, as a worldwide research, expect companies to uh, make sure they are moving towards environmental sustainability. All the other concerns are also quite real. It's really hard to see on the slide. But it's absolutely mind-boggling to see that the global socially connected people on social networks, for example, 63% of them are going younger and greener. Right? They're more interested in what goes on. They're becoming the mainstream of things. Right? And you have companies like Puma saying that they are going to take the so-called externalities, you know, the external effects, and bring it into the business plan. But if only one company does this, like Patagonia or Puma or Adidas or whatever, right? What, what happens to all the other companies? Do they have an unfair advantage? The government needs to mandate those things to go into the business plan, right? to give back what we take out. So very soon, every, every person, every politician, every businessman, and every futurist, every speaker, every organization will be judged by how much they are ranked on what they give back to the ecosystem. We already have this today with companies. But this is going to be a reality with lots of people because now social media, I don't even have to ask how many of you are on Orkut or Facebook or Twitter. That's like asking who's going to go to the toilet later. Social media is enabling us to interconnect globally. We are on our way to what I call a global brain. I mean, the information that we're getting from people is mind-boggling, and it's, of course, many times is just too much, and it can be quite disruptive. I mean, we can go to Recycle Bank on Facebook and find out how we can recycle better at home, along with another, what is the number there, 283,000 people sharing tips on recycling. Facebook activism. I mean, there's, last year there were 56 laws overturned because of Facebook action. 
There were over 2,000 actions against banks and oil companies and car companies on Facebook that forced those people to change their policies. I mean, this is, of course, happening every single day here in Brazil. Right? I mean, we have this collaboration of what people do in this global brain. And I think it's very important that we innovate with a global brain. We take what we do here and export it. We import what other people do there. And there is a global connectivity on innovation. This is not about making an island. So, as I said, every company will be judged by this. And now you already have over 50 websites like this one called The Good Guide, where you can look up companies to see how good they are doing to the overall common good. And you can rank them. You can buy products at this company called climatecounts.org to see how much they're doing towards the environment. And then you can decide what kind of refrigerator to, you to buy. And this is becoming a standard. So the rating of this clearly forces us to reimagine things. This is a great slideshow by Mary Meeker from Kleiner Perkins, who is the chief investor in Facebook. So what she said out in the slideshow, and you can just, uh, if you want to download it, it's, I think just look for Mary Meeker, State of the Internet. It's a fantastic 200-page document. She says, it's time to imagine everything. Reimagine how we call a taxi. Right, right here, or not over there in Sao Paulo, you can call a taxi using an app, not with a phone. You can pay with a credit card swiper on an iPhone. I mean, reimagine of life stories, reimagination of education, all these things are happening in the next five years. Your kids, if they're little today, they're not going to study with textbooks and printed books. I mean, even in Thailand, they've already bought several million tablets to give to the students to replace a textbook with built-in connectivity. If we had a $10 machine, and you can buy a, a tablet for $10, right? It's possible. That's connected to the internet. Do we need textbooks? So that is really going to change the reimagination of everything. And Alvin Toffler, who is one of my mentors as a futurist, he says, the illiterate of the 21st century are not those who cannot read and write, but those who cannot learn and unlearn and relearn. And if you're 20, unlearning and relearning is not such a challenge. You know, you do that every day. But when you're 40 or 50 or 60, it's very hard to take away all that garbage that you've learned that supposedly worked. And, and it does work, but it does work no longer. I worked in the music business for 10 years. And you know, the music business has been the worst transition from the traditional business to the digital business. The music business has declined by 74% in 10 years because they could not relearn. They could not understand what the consumer actually wants. Instead, they took the consumer to court to make them relearn what they should be learning. I mean, think about this paradox. So, I think Brazil could lead this reimagination. Because this means we have to go forward quickly. I mean, the speed is essential here. Speed and risk-taking. I live in Switzerland where the mantra of business people in Switzerland is to never be first. This is not a bad thing. This is a, just a fact. Right? Where people are saying, we're not going to be the first ones to try this and take a huge risk. In what I call ecosystem thinking, it's actually quite advanced in Brazil. Of course, Brazil has, I think, almost 80% renewable energy already which is quite interesting. But uh, this company, Pepsi, is coming to Brazil with a project called the Pepsi 10, PepsiCo 10, to where they're investing into 10 companies to make the world a better place. That, that, that is the rule. And this is very interesting because now they've arrived in Brazil and this is a huge thing. People can participate in creating really, really interesting projects and be funded by Pepsi. And why would a brand like this do this? I mean, I don't like Pepsi as a drink, but this is certainly an interesting angle. Right? The fact that they're, they're trying to change something and have some positive impact. And this is their press release saying, in Brazil, business sustainability is among the submission categories for the reason that sustainability is a particular critical communications objective. So here in this country, those Ventures will be judged by sustainability. 
Now, you, know, may this, you, know, you may know this company called Patagonia. They make clothes, you know, jackets and stuff. Right? This is the most successful advertising campaign in America from Patagonia was a campaign that says, don't buy this jacket. And the reason is that you shouldn't buy a jacket if you still have one, you can have it fixed, or you can have it recycled, or you can sell it on eBay to somebody who wants it, right? Is to not use all the resources. Interestingly, of course, in that year, Patagonia sold 20% more jackets, <laughs> despite the, the advertising campaign. So this is the question I have for you. I don't have an answer for that. Is there a business in consuming less? I mean, you can't possibly argue that we're going to consume more and more and more, and then we're going to invent more technology to take away the, the effects of consumption, and then we'll all be happy in the end, right? I mean, that would be kind of strange. That, that is clearly not going to work. So the combination of making it more efficient and using technology, but also consuming differently, is a requirement in my view. I mean, in Brazil, the car culture in Brazil is exploding. People are buying cars, you know, why not switch to a sharing or electric car economy? That would be a move that could preempt some of these issues. So this picture, I think, shows a path into the future. And that path is based on creating new ecosystems for energy, for money, for education, and for media. And those will be based on collaborative things, to a large degree. We're still going to have large media companies and large energy companies, of course. But the emphasis is shifting to a collaborative effect on creating new ecosystems. I mean, this slide is a, forgot where I got it, on the internet somewhere. It's shifting from centralized to decentralized to distributed. I'll give you some examples on this, but this is a substantial shift. They were saying, if you're going to be a centralized company, I think it's still possible, but very unlikely you'll succeed. That, that is Apple, for example. A decentralized distributed system like eBay right, is exploding because we're selling to each other, and that same goes for YouTube and others, right? So a distributed economy, distributed energy, distributed media, distributed business, that's sort of where the whole thing is going. And as Marshall McLuhan was saying, you know what this really means is considerable chaos. Because anything that's top down is a lot easier and, and quicker, obviously, because it's easy to control. How will the music business reinvent? Well, they're going to be distributed in the cloud. How, how will the movie business reinvent in the same way? I mean, you have Netflix in this country, right? The only reason it doesn't work very well because they don't get the movies from the, from the studios. They're worried about cable in Brazil. That is the only reason. So distributed economy, and this is an interesting chart, you know, has all these attributes. And I will make this available later for downloading on my Twitter account, G. Leonhard is my Twitter account. So you can download the PDF from there later. There's quite a lot of stuff here. But in an ecosystem, we're making the switch from centralized to distributed from scheduled to real time, from invented inside to invented anywhere. All these shifts are happening in parallel. So if you want to innovate, do not stake your future on the ecosystem, right? on the economy, as they call it. Right? We're basically looking at the shift of money from all the money being in the centralized system in a one-way, one-to-many thing, slowly shifting over towards an ecosystem. And again, this is not in the sense of green. This is in the sense of distribution, participation, and also in the sense of environment. Here's a couple examples. In energy, we're shifting from carbon-based fuels and oil, which is completely run by very, very few companies in the world right, who make enormous profits to distributed energy. And the, the same money that will go into the old economy will go into distributed energy in the very near future. In the car economy, we'll go from Henry Ford to the self-driving car. And think about the shifts, what that means for, for business. Not owning a car, but sharing a car, that is our future. Number one trend worldwide for transportation is bicycles, shared bicycles. And clearly, that is going to be a solution to a lot of traffic issues. 
central organizations that do big events to people going direct like C.K. Lewis, Lewis C.K., sorry, uh, comedian, who sells his tickets directly through his website and is extremely successful rather than going with big companies that go through and banks moving to self-funding, right? micro-funding like Kiva, people lending money to each other. There's already millions of people doing this, going directly to lending money to small places in Africa for $100. Same goes for video, so over-the-top video replacing a lot of the major television channels. Imagine this, that in the next two years or three years in many places around the world, regular television will just be one of the apps. So Globo or any of those that you're currently watching, that will just be one option in your app, in your app menu. Right? Not the default. That is going to be a substantial shift of business models also going away. You know, what happens, of course, with artists going direct, like Amanda Palmer, signing directly with Kickstarter. And, of course, the ultimate example really is this. Right? MTV still exists but they're having a hell of a hard time figuring out what their business model is because people are no longer going there for videos and it's no longer about music. YouTube has taken that spot in 18 months. So, Tim O'Reilly, who's a publisher, he says, if you take more out than you put in, the ecosystem eventually fails. And we're seeing this now, right? We're seeing the complete failure of this ecosystem as we see, for example, in the American economy. All the stuff being taken out, but very little being put back in. Not in terms of taxes, but in terms of everything. Record labels, all companies. So really what our future entails is what I call interdependence. And I've taken this theme from a great movie by Tiffany Schlein that I think is also available in Brazil now. It's called Connected, the film. It's about how we're shifting from independence, from being independent and self-run, to interdependence. And we'll play a short clip. Okay, this picture, sorry I couldn't actually stop it with the trees, that shows where we are going. Right? We're interconnected and basically developing business models based on a mutual benefit. And I would submit to you that this is true capitalism. Right? This is not socialism. The fact that we create a mutual benefit for each other creates a new economy of new growth that does not kill each other. And that's sort of where we're going. I mean, we need to start paying for the real costs a hamburger that we all, most of us like to eat consumes 2,400 liters of water. I mean, not the burger, but the cow, of course. Right? So when we think about the externalities that are involved you know, in this kind of idea, for example, in Bali, where I did vacation last year, aids of plastic end up in the river and the oceans. Right? Those are considered externalities. You know, everybody just thinks it goes away. But it's not true. We have to start paying you know, for the real cost of oil and for the real cost of flying. This is EasyJet in Europe where you can go for 10 pounds to have a party in Malaga when you live in Manchester. I mean, there's something wrong with this system that allows us to do these things without actually thinking about what happens on the other end. And a lot of people refer to this as an ego system pathology, a disease. And that disease includes fuel subsidies, for example. It's just something that we do, or lobbying. One trillion dollars of fuel subsidies per year is spent on sustaining the carbon economy. Imagine if they only gave people a hundred billion to innovate the green economy. How much would that change everybody's life for the benefit? So that needs to end, and I think we're we're right now in the middle of the shift from the industrial age thinking about profit and growth to an ecosystem. And uh, the government of Bhutan calls this 
thinking that grows national happiness. So rather than talking about gross national product, they have the minister of gross national happiness, right? And he's basically using this idea of a connected ecosystem. It's a very interesting example. Of course, it's a little bit easier in Bhutan, considering, of course, the size of Bhutan is probably the size of, of Porto Alegre. <laughs> uh, so it's a little bit of a different story. But we're looking at quite possibly the rebooting of capitalism. And again, don't get me wrong, this is not that we have an alternative to capitalism that has ever really worked. But we need to have sustainable capitalism, right? what some people refer to as natural capitalism, based on an economic growth that keeps the world moving along. So this is what uh, the uh, Karma Chi team says, the Secretary of Gross National Happiness, he says, gross national happiness is more important than gross national product. Maybe this could be Jima's new paradigm, if I pronounce her name correctly. Right? Gross national happiness as opposed to gross domestic product. And other people are talking about this in a different way and saying that we really need a triple bottom line. People, profit, and the planet. And this triple bottom line is obviously in many ways, is mission impossible. I mean, think about that for a second, right? If you're running a big company, you're going to make a decision to have more profit, but make it a little bit more tough on the planet, but better for your people, which choice are you going to take? So the triple bottom line, which is a, an old book, you know, by, uh, I forgot who wrote it actually, it was about six or seven years ago, but just look it up, right? This is a very, very interesting scenario that I think we're going to see in the, in the near future. Now, here's about Brazil. I, mean, I can't tell you much about Brazil because I, I live in Switzerland, but uh, I've been over here a few times, and it's clear that Brazil's digital ecosystem is exploding. And there's a unique opportunity here. If you're looking at what's happening is that most of e-commerce in South America is done in Portuguese. LinkedIn started an office here, 10 million registered users. In Rio, there's a huge startup scene of technology. This is a map of Rio startups. Advertising growth is exploding in Brazil. Social media is going crazy with 100% penetration. The mobile phone, of course, taken off. Online video is exploding. Smartphones, broadband. And Brazil is paying the highest prices in the world for some of these products. As I'm sure I don't have to tell you, that is not clearly not going to work out to get all of the other classes, as we call them, into the same benefit, right? That, that has to change. So mobile devices and mobile internet are tools of inclusion. And this is why it's so important to include everyone to be able to use them and have them. And clearly, I've, I proposed in Indonesia, where I do a lot of work, to make the internet free. In Finland, you can sue the government if you can't get on the internet. It's a civil right. Because the internet drives a lot of that growth, right, and, and that tools of ex and exclusion. And we're seeing here basically uh, prediction says by 2015, 100 million people will have a mobile phone with internet access. Think about what that will change. Content consumption, news, publishing, music, ticket buying, e-commerce, mobile banking. So in order to drive that as a tool of innovation, it has to be made available to absolutely everyone. I mean, it's clear that the benefit here is huge. And as I was saying earlier, in Thailand, they have started giving away tablets. Of course, there are other problems in Thailand why it's not working. <laughs> not to really comment on that. But, on that. But, I forgot one word on this headline. And that word is only the connected and the network will flourish. Because in this world today, if, if information isn't flowing, you can't get inside of something. You're not part of the network society. Chances are you're not going to be part of the network money. You're not going to be part of the network revenues. This is why it's so important to see what's happening here. And I think the future of business means bitter pill for many of us who are running large companies, right? the decline of empires and the rise of networks. This is an economic fact, that I think, that we're seeing around the world. Clearly, network companies are succeeding, and others, with very few exceptions, 
are failing, right? No matter what you think of Facebook, with roughly over a billion users and a totally overvalued stock just a few months ago or weeks ago, right? Facebook is the infrastructure for this, for this universal highway, the rise of networks. Going back to the barking up the wrong tree, in Brazil, just I think a week ago, many publishers decided to get out of Google News. I don't know if you read this news, right? They don't want Google News to excerpt things. They want them to send them back to the website after just the headline. Right? So publishers decided that they don't want to be listed on Google News with anything but the headline. And clearly what this means is that publishers are looking just like the record labels. This is the association of the record labels saying that global piracy causes trillions of dollars of damage. Right? Rather than changing the business model to encompass what everybody wants to do, they want to change the people to consume in the same way than before. And let me ask you, this is not a very smart move. It reminds me of an ecosystem. It reminds me of the oil companies. Because clearly there is a business model in doing it differently. It has actually been shown. The business model that says, you know, as, uh, as Tim O'Reilly says, restricting access to content in a digital ecosystem is a bad business model in the age of a global network. What are you going to do? Are you going to roll back time? Okay. Not going to happen. Our only choice for a new business model is a connected economy. And it's painful to create that connected economy when you are a publisher that has attention monopolies for 50 years. Yes, true. But still, that's where we're going. Five minutes? Okay. Thank you. So I think it's crucial here in Brazil to keep the internet open, networked, interdependent, interoperable, available to all, and common. To protect the open sphere of the internet to drive innovation. Because Brazil is in a great position to grow differently. I mean, we're seeing the GDP rise, of course, along with China. Now, the rise actually is very similar. It's a little bit hard to see on this slide here. But the challenge is to come up with something that I would call, people have called, responsible capitalism. Responsible capitalism that includes not ignoring the major challenges like climate change. So, Brazil just announced a couple of days ago that in the next climate talks, Brazil is not ready to think about making concessions on a global scale right, that, that we're seeing. And this is a huge problem, of course, because basically, this is the status of most developing countries who are saying, why should we grow less because the other guys polluted everything? This is a major discussion point. I think it needs more time. Brazil, of course, leads the world in deforestation. Well, until now, I not, don't really have the current numbers. Maybe you can show me some other stuff later. But clearly, this is a, a challenge right, to come up with a business model for natural capitalism here. Clearly, and this goes hand in hand with inequality. The latest research I can find in Brazil is down here, right? It's uh, more inequality in Brazil than there even is in America, which is quite an accomplishment, right? because there's a lot of it in America, as we're seeing now. Equality goes hand in hand with sustainability. I mean, clearly, this is a, a huge challenge and also a huge business opportunity. The CEO of Tesco, one of the biggest global brands in retail, mostly for food, he said last week at a conference that their choice is to lead the revolution or be a victim of the evolution. And I was really amazed to see a conservative company with 200,000 employers, employees right, saying that this is what they want to do. They want to lead into the future rather than being led by somebody else. So let me give you a brief summary and then, um, and then it's time to move on. So, my view is that our future means that we're moving from an ecosystem, from an economy, into an ecosystem. In every possible way, in politics, in technology, in energy. And all the money is shifting from this into an ecosystem. We must broaden our thinking to think about the entire community. The commons, not just the individuals. Because we know where that is going, clearly that is going to a global explosion. The three overlapping areas where we have to create a 
sustainable business that comes out of economics and social interests and environmental interests, right? The triple bottom line. If you can solve that problem, you are up for the next huge trillion dollar economy. Decoupling growth from environmental impact. You want to start a company? Figure out how to grow without impacting, taking from the, from the environment without giving back. I mean, clearly that is about 90% of most of the business plans of these startups. Offensive innovation. I, I can say that here in Brazil because you don't have a problem with this. But in Europe, we have a huge problem with this. Yeah, we don't want to be offensive. We want to be quiet and wait. Right? So I would encourage you to be extremely aggressive with innovation. Because if it's not disruptive, then what's the point of it? We'll move into a distributed economy. And this is absolutely inevitable. If you're a publisher or a record label or a music company, what are you going to do about this? You're going to cry foul for five years and die. That's where we're going. You have to figure out a new business model. Being part of a global brain, I think this is crucial, and Brazil is doing, making a lot of really good efforts on this. Reimagine everything. If it's not working, reimagine it. I mean, this is clearly a mission that we're going to see uh, driving lots of disruption in the future. And all of these things, you know, basically moving from the ego to the ego, you can download some of that stuff later and take another look at it. I think the idea of gross national happiness has a lot of merit because it takes into account the triple bottom line, not just revenues and growth. And I think this is a very good paradigm coming from Bhutan that we should consider here for Brazil. I'm speaking in Sao Paulo next week on November 5th on more on this topic at the Museum of Sound. So please meet me there if you're around in Sao Paulo. And I thank you very much. And I'm looking forward to a good debate later. If you have any feedback, just Twitter, G. Leonhard, or Ask Gert. Or just talk to me in person. That's also a possibility. Thanks very much.